Saxonville. What does that name conjure up in your mind? For me, it's confusion, disappointment, and uh, the stench of wasted opportunity. Because as you guys might remember, in January of 2018, the Jacksonville Jaguars were about a quarter away from playing in their first Super Bowl in franchise history. But just over two years later, the team is now a shell of what that magical run looked like, with its defense hemorrhaging key pieces by the minute, and the offense on the cusp of starting three different opening week quarterbacks over the past three seasons. That spiral from glorious underdogs back to basement dwelling in the AFC South has not been a pretty one to watch for Jags fans. So today, I want to not only understand why this happened, but what it means for the franchise's future. With that said, I would like to delay talking about Blake Bortles playing quarterback for as long as humanly possible. So first, let's do something much more pleasant, and let me tell you guys about the sponsor of today's video over at Raycon. You guys know Ray J, right? He's famous for many things, the most important of which being that he co-founded Raycon and created these new Everyday E25 wireless earbuds. These are their latest and most improved model, and honestly, it really does show. They come in a variety of colors, they can be fitted to your ears to ensure that beautiful, beautiful noise isolation, they also last six hours on a single charge, and oh yeah, they come in at half the price of just about every other premium wireless brand. In my personal opinion, completely detached from Raycon, these little guys are the best deal on the market for earbuds right now. So if you're interested in getting your hands on some, head to buyraycon.com slash set the edge to get 15% off your very own pair. So a huge thank you again to Raycon, and now to understand how these Jags went from contenders to slowly watching their dreams evaporate, let's take a trip to the jungle. No, 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 no I'm not that jungle. This one is not that cool. The Jacksonville Jaguars were born in 1995, doomed to a life ranging from mediocrity to abject suffering. In 2012, though, the team was purchased by Shad Khan and hoped to turn a new leaf with the vision of building something special with a young Blaine Gabbard at the helm. This went poorly, and it would be a harbinger of things to come, with five straight losing seasons to follow and a combined 17-63 and record in that span. The team had drafted yet another would-be savior with a top 10 pick by taking Blake Bortles at number 3 overall in 2014, but he did little to inspire hope in his first few seasons, quickly developing a reputation as, uh, how do I put this, uh, bad at not giving the ball to the other team. So by the 2017 season, saying Jaguars fans had suffered for a while was a slight understatement, and owner Shad Khan decided it was time to make a change in the front office to try and shift the team's long-standing culture struggles. So, they brought in Tom Coughlin as executive vice president, a two-time Super Bowl winning head coach who also happened to be the first head coach in Jaguars history. Khan gave Coughlin the final say on all football matters, over head coach Doug Marone, and over GM since 2013 David Caldwell. It was an unconventional dynamic to say the least, but conventional had already long failed the Jags, and Coughlin had a very set vision of what his operation would look like, and his disciplinary reputation already preceded him. No nonsense, strict accountability, and the tightest ship run imaginable, just as he ran things as coach of the New York Giants. Soon enough, big names were brought in through free agency with the likes of Calais Campbell, A.J. Bouye, Barry Church, and then with the drafting of Leonard Fournette at fourth overall, the roster started to take a new shape with Coughlin at the helm. However, with doubt still surrounding the boat and the historic incompetency of the franchise just as a whole, expectations were not much higher than usual for Jacksonville. But their defense, on the other hand, they had a couple of other plans. Flacco on first down, looking for Macklin. Great adjustment, juggled, and picked off. Percent dancing in the pocket. He's in trouble. He goes down and loses the football. Mariota from the gun on third and five under pressure, and he is set. First and ten. Oh, they got around him. And got real. And it's picked off. Ramsey with his third of the year. With a second down to 11, going away to the block. Yeah. And the left. That's picked off. May have been deflected. Talvin Smith, the linebacker, into the end zone. Surprising just about everybody, the Jaguars went 10-6 and, and clinched the AFC South for the first time since 1999. Their defense was completely lights out, with a ferocious pass rush that totaled 55 sacks and a back end that was high and above the best in football. Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Bouye were the best corner tandem in the league, Calais Campbell recorded a franchise record 14 and a half sacks, and alongside Yannick Ngakwe and Malik Jackson, the Jags' D-line was a complete nightmare for opposing quarterbacks. 
Here is a quick list of everything the 2017 Jacksonville defense ended the season either ranking first or second in the league in. It's a lot of categories. Another important thing to note is that the injury bug spared Jacksonville almost entirely, with 8 of their 11 starters playing the entire 16 game campaign. The offense also did more than enough to keep the team in games as well, with a rookie Leonard Fournette spearheading the top rushing attack in the NFL as they averaged 141 rushing yards per game, with Fournette also becoming the team's first 1,000 yard rusher since 2011. Bortles still struggled at times, but the success he found playing second fiddle to the run game and nursing early leads allowed him to cut down on his turnover habit and not torpedo the dominance of his defense. Their playoff run would see a heartbreaking loss in Foxborough to the Patriots in the AFC title game, but regardless, that was the highest the franchise had reached in decades, and it looked to be just the start of their reign of terror in causing offensive coordinators to wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. The offseason evaluations and projections that followed placed the Jaguars right back into the orbit of deep playoff contention in 2018, with a relatively quiet offseason apart from a cap-saving move made to extend Bortles to a three-year deal. This move would age like milk in the Sahara Desert. Nonetheless, nearly their entire defensive unit was returning, and there was no apparent reason that they had plans to slow down. However, 2018 saw what was capable of happening to these new-look Jaguars if circumstances didn't play out in their favor. And in the end, it exposed the flaws that would crash the team back down to earth just as quickly as they had risen. Leonard Fournette went down early with a hamstring injury and eventually missed six games and a seventh due to a suspension, leaving Blake Bortles to be the offense's engine and as a result often stalling out drives before they even left their own territory. But it wasn't just Bortles, because the defense took a step back from their dominance of 2017 as well, struggling to stop the run and a lack of explosiveness and energy off the ball that made them such a force to be reckoned with before. I think this play sums it up pretty well. One of the greatest advantages the team had the previous year was their ability to jump ahead and control the pace by pounding the ball with Fournette. Once the opposition needed to start throwing to stay in the game, the Jags had them right where they wanted them, able to place all their confidence in the coverage skills of their secondary and sending their pass rushers down the quarterback's throat to force mistakes. But without Fournette and that ability to strike early, Bortles was exposed to a whole variety of situations that were not ideal for him within that system, like needing to trust him to make big time throws, or even sometimes small time throws. I mean, as a front office, when your recently extended quarterback is benched for Cody Kessler after a 3-8 start to the season, it's a good indication you should probably go purchase clown makeup for putting yourself into that situation. He still is undefeated in Super Bowls though. Oh yeah, and then there was the flood of off-field issues as well that started to begin to show the flaws with having Tom Coughlin as the judge, jury, and executioner of the team, like fining Dante Fowler over $700,000 for 25 separate incidents in the offseason, all of which were bogus and he would later win a dispute over, and even voiding Leonard Fournette's contract guarantees following his one-game suspension. The Iron Fist approach just didn't translate to the modern NFL. The team was one of the most undisciplined in the league when it came to penalties, and yet again locker room and culture concerns began to threaten what appeared to be an insanely bright future just months earlier as the team would sputter to a 5-11 finish. So heading into 2019, the team decided it was better late than never to let go of Blake Bortles, eating $16.5 million in dead money as a result of that doomed extension, and then signing former Super Bowl MVP Nick Foles to a four-year $88 million deal in hopes they could somehow squeeze the remaining life out of their championship hopes even though they were growing fainter and fainter by the minute. And what might be the best part, I don't have a clue how the Jags continue to do it as a front office, but that signing might have aged even worse than the Bortles deal. Foles broke his collarbone in week one of the season and wouldn't return until week 11, and when he did, the results were underwhelming at best. Gardner Minshew, on the other hand, was a complete breath of fresh air early in the season and probably set a new record for most Halloween costumes inspired. But ultimately, it's still anyone's guess as to whether or not he is the quarterback of the future or just going to be a flash in the pan, despite the undying love for him that many Jags fans understandably have. Over the course of the season, the face of that 2017 defense in Jalen Ramsey began having more and more problems with the organization than you can even count, coming up with every possible reason to not be involved with team activities and eventually forcing the front office's hand in dealing him to the Rams in the middle of the season, albeit for a very nice return. But overall though, from front to back, save Minshew Mania, the 2019 Jaguars felt like a team who, from top to bottom, did not know what they wanted their identity to be. 
both their offense and defense ranked bottom five in DVOA per football outsiders, and they also became the first team since the 1986 Buccaneers to lose five straight games by 17 or more points, finishing the season six and 10, and once again at the bottom of the AFC South. That kind of showing is embarrassing and entirely confusing when you consider the fact that the team had the exact same organizational structure that it had when they were just a few plays away from winning the AFC title game less than two years prior. Somebody had to go, and Tom Coughlin would be fired unceremoniously in December following a letter sent out to all NFLPA members warning players about signing with Jacksonville considering their pension for absurd fines and disciplinary actions. In fact, it was reported that over 25% of grievances filed with the NFLPA over the past two seasons were over the operations of the Jaguars, 25% of the entire league's grievances with one team. Regardless of how they have played and regressed over the past few seasons, one thing is abundantly clear. The Jaguars were a toxic environment under Tom Coughlin, and the overall mismanagement of this organization does not appear to be leaving even though Coughlin has. The Dante Fowler debacle was embarrassing, the Ramsey debacle was embarrassing, Yannick Ngakwe is all but out the door at this point after saying he has no interest in a long-term deal. The team is almost unrecognizable, having recently traded AJ Bouye for a fourth to Denver, Calais Campbell for just a fifth round pick to the Ravens, as well as dealing Nick Foles for a fourth to the Bears just to unload his massive contract. This means the team paid him $30.5 million for his zero wins in the four games he played, and they are now going to absorb $18.75 million in dead money this season just to get rid of him. This front office has fumbled nearly every piece of one of the best defenses in the league, thrown ridiculous money at quarterbacks that were total pipe dreams, and developed a reputation as one of the worst organizations to play for in the entire NFL during that time. Oh, and Doug Marone is returning as head coach, and David Caldwell is also returning at GM for his eighth consecutive season, with the team hoping that this shift in organizational structure will be enough to reset a team that is currently on fire. Tom Coughlin's hiring was an attempt at a quick 180 into the disciplined machines that brought the Giants two rings, but with as much respect as he deserves as a coach, Coughlin never was going to fit as an executive despite what the team's success managed to hide. It's very true that winning cures all, and so when the Jags stopped winning, it was revealed just how thin and fragile the foundation of their success really was. That 2017 defense certainly was not a mirage, but I think it's becoming apparent that their championship window always was, and now they're back to square one. That singular 10-6 season created the idea that the Jags were just this close from doing it all over again and actually making it to the Super Bowl, and that hype that the front office bought into would very quickly become the organization's downfall. I understand that Shad Khan's ownership style is hands-off and get that turning the Jaguars around was never ever going to be an easy task, but the lack of significant change over the entirety of his ownership really makes you wonder what plan he has for the future. The team built one of the best defenses, period, in recent years, and then drove almost all of those players out of town, and you really have to admire those levels of self-sabotage. Who knows what the future legitimately holds, but all signs are pointing towards things getting worse before they get better. There's of course caveats. If Minshew can reignite the spark in the team and prove himself as the franchise's future, things could shape up a lot more quickly than I personally think they will. And they do have the draft capital to do it, so it's not like all hope is lost. But until that day does come, I think the legacy of these past few years of Jacksonville football is cemented in the fact that it's just as easy to stumble into success as it is to ruin it all almost immediately. And with their 2017 roster all but history, I think the Jaguars front office has become the perfect example of that.